Okay, so, um, I actually forgot to put your, uh, homework three assignment up until earlier today, so that's up now in case you've already finished, uh, your homework three. Um, I've, I've added its submission, um, to your grade sheet. I also forgot to upload your exam one score, so I'll do that, uh, today, uh, later. So, so before, before lecture tomorrow, you'll, you'll have those, uh, those up. I actually meant to do it over the weekend, but I was got a little sidetracked. So um, I'm going to finish chapter seven today, which is uh, this discussion of, uh, or more like a survey of the remaining classical crypto systems. So um, all of the classical crypto systems um, that uh, we've talked about so far, uh, starting Friday, um, and uh, what we'll finish out today. Um, every single one of these uh, is an example of what's called um, a symmetric crypto system. So all of these, so all of these are uh, symmetric crypto systems. Um, I can't remember if I wrote that uh, last time or if I said those words. So um, what a symmetric crypto system is, uh, the symmetric bit is um is referring to the key um and so uh what this means is that uh both sender and receiver have exactly the same info for encrypting going forward and decry decrypting going backwards right so um, now that's, uh, that is nice in one way. It's nice in that, um, a lot of these algorithms are very simple. Um, and, uh, I don't have to think too hard about, uh, about the info one way or the other, but there's, uh, there's a good reason why, you know, there's, um, a problem here and why, um, we're going to talk about, uh, um, asymmetric crypto systems later. Uh, so one issue with this, of course, is that if you get into the specifics of how the key is to be sent, um, then that's a real problem, right? Because at its core, we're talking about sending encrypted messages. But um, if the sender and receiver are not uh, in contact um, and they both need to have the exact same info to do either encrypting or decrypting, then the key itself has to be passed somehow, right? But then you get in a circular problem where, you know, the method of passing the key along um, if that I itself isn't secure, right, then, then you're, you're kind of, uh, in a pickle because, uh, you know, if, if someone actually intercepts the key, well, then they've got your whole encryption method, right? So anyway, um, so there's, there's weaknesses here. And of course, all these classical crypto systems that we're going to talk about, uh, are not super duper strong. Um, so we'll talk about much stronger, more sophisticated stuff a bit later. Um, uh, but anyway, um, I had mentioned at the end of class last time. So as I said in the chat, um, I'm going to, just to make this not take a really long time, uh, because there would be a lot of text I would have to write down, um, I'm essentially going to turn on audiobook mode and I'm going to be going uh, over um, uh, this bit of chapter seven, so the last half of chapter seven. So I mentioned last time visionaire ciphers. Um, so uh, the idea was um, to come up with a way of encrypting that defeated in some way uh, frequency analysis, right? So uh, here was the example of using frequency analysis for um, sentences in English to actually deduce how a cipher has been shifted. So this kind of makes shift ciphers uh, really, really easy uh, to break looking at frequency analysis like this. Of course, as I said, shift ciphers are easy to break, period, without frequency analysis. But frequency analysis itself is very useful for other types of encryption I want to mention later, so I'm just showing you how, how this works. So the idea with the Visionaire cipher is it's like a shift cipher, except uh, the shift is this cyclical thing. It's not a fixed shift of, of each letter, right? So um, the idea here being that, uh, for instance, this is a secret, right? Here is your plain text. And when you encrypt it, you have a key. Let's say the length of the key is four. So my key consists of positive integers two, five, four, and seven. So what I do then is I place the key 
here underneath my plain text in that cycle two five four seven two five four seven two five four seven um, and here because I, I don't there's not my plain text uh, characters there's there's one extra here I loop only to two right so um, so I can always do this um, anyway and then I shifted according to the number showing the corresponding number showing up in the key so two gets shifted or T gets shifted two places to V H gets shifted five places to um, uh, to M and I get shifted four places to M and so on. Okay, so this is how this is how it goes. Um, so anyway, um, and uh, doing it that way, we can suppose that we have some cipher text that's this big, huge chunk of text here. Okay, so um, so let's say I have this big, giant chunk of text. So I believe up through the end of World War One, maybe I'm. Yeah, so through the end of World War One, like during World War One, this visionary cipher was considered as like being really, really, really secure. Um, and so actually, we're going to read this funny message here uh, in a second, um, showing a, a warning against it not being that secure. So um, basically, the the best way to describe how uh, like the the problems with this visionary cipher. Um, is to think about how to break it and how to break it is the following you look at this big block uh, of text and look at it looking at it you look for patterns okay um, so for patterns here the pattern that I'm going to notice is that there's a rep repeating sequence of length 3 that shows up a bunch here and it's VHX so VHX is here the next uh, time it happens is here there's another VHX uh, down here's a VHX and I think there's at least one more uh, did, I miss, did I miss it yeah it's here VHX is there okay so there's four instances of this VHX thing okay and so um, basically uh, you just notice, oh, it actually occurs five times. I don't know if I said five or four. So anyway, um, so, so you notice this pattern. Okay. Um, and what you do is you take, uh, you, you keep track of where the VHXs are located in the cipher, right? Because, of course, the way that this cipher is done here, um, let's see, I'm a little, there we go. So the way that this cipher is done is the cyclical business so I want to keep track of where the V is showing up where the first uh, letter in this pattern is showing up here so here it shows up in the first letter uh, the next one is in the 133rd letter uh, the next is in the 172nd letter uh, the next is in the 100, uh, 190th letter and the last one is in the 280th letter okay um, and again, you know, so it mentions here VHX corresponds to three letters of the plain text uh, shifted by amounts corresponding to the shifts required by the key. We don't know what the key length is. Okay. So um, if you say that each VHX comes from the same three letters that are shifted by the same amount, uh, the key is applied cyclically. So that means that the distances between these occurrences have to be multiples of the key length. Okay. Um, and so uh, in particular, here you're saying uh, that you're going between the distance from successive occurrences of VHX. So the first VHX happens immediately. There it is, VHX. The next one's at the 133rd letter. So 133 minus 1, that's the distance from the first occurrence of VHX to the next one. So one, 133 minus 1 is 132. That's the distance. Uh, between the next two, it's... Uh, 172 minus 133, that's 39. Uh, the next two, uh, or the next pair is 190 minus 172, that's 18. And the last pair is uh, 280 minus um, 190, that's 90. So then if all those are multiples of the key length, they have to be multiples of the GCD of, or sorry, the, the GCD itself has to be a multiple of the key length. And the GCD of those four numbers is three. So then it's reasonable to guess that the key length is three and, and we'll see that that is the, the correct guess. Of course, you know, there's there's many ways in which this could go wrong. Uh, of course, like it, whatever the GCD you get here is, you might have multiple things that you would be reasonable guesses. So it, it's a matter of just trial and error here. 
Um, but the idea is, in this case, we're going to guess that the key length is 3. Um, and so what you do here is um, you then start with the first letter. So uh, And then you say that if the key length is going to be 3, then the letters in the 1st, 4th, 7th, 10th, 14th position, and so on, right? So 1 plus 3, 4 plus 3, 7 plus 3, and so on. So you're adding 3 each time. Those letters have to be shifted by the same amount. Oh, I'm pointing to something that's slightly off camera. So uh, the letters in the first, fourth, seventh, tenth, and third, or fourteenth positions, and so on, have to be shifted by the same amount because I'm saying that the key length is three. So if I were to take this block of text and simply delete everything except the letters in those slots, then the resulting block of text that I get here is going to be just a straight shift cipher. And for instance, I could use frequency analysis on this truncated block of text to get some plot that would tell me what the shift is. And so that first shift I find by looking at this plot is two. And you can do the same thing for positions two, five, eight, eleven, and so on. And you get that the second shift is zero. The last positions, uh, so you get that, uh, um, if you look at the last position, 3, 6, 9, 12, and so on, you get that it's a shift by 19. And so the guess is that the key is 2, 0, 19. Um, and it turns out that the key is, in fact, 2, 0, 19. And so if you actually apply that, there's the frequency analyses for, um, for the other two truncated blocks of, of text. Um, and so it turns out that if you apply... Uh, that key 2019 so key of length 3 2019 this is what you get when you decrypt so the method used for the preparation and reading of code messages is simple in the extreme and at the same time impossible of translation unless the key is known the ease with which the key may be changed is another point in favor of the adoption of this code by those desiring to transmit important messages without the slightest danger of their messages being read by political or business rivals etc this chunk of text actually appeared in a 1917 Scientific American article. Um, but the fact that we were able to uh, decipher this, right, uh, should uh, should definitely show you that um, I think the article was definitely uh, a little bit too uh, eager with their claim that this was completely impossible to break without knowing the key. Okay, and so while this could be a very annoying uh, thing to do, uh, the process to actually go through. Um, this is this is definitely something um, that is that is breakable uh, by hand. Even you don't need anything fancy to break this. You just need uh, dedication. Okay, so that brings us to transposition ciphers. So um, transposition ciphers are in some way the easiest of the classical crypto systems that we'll talk about. Um, here's ciphertext. You have no idea what that says. Uh, but this is actually encrypted by an extremely easy uh, method. Um, split this into two. So the first half, the second half. So I-A-R-A-T-I and C-N-E-D-H-S. Okay, and then put these two halves into columns. Oof, oof, there they are. And then read them in a zigzag pattern like this. It's I can read this. There it is. Okay. So what is this called? This is called zigzag writing or rail fence cipher um, or what we're going to call a transposition cipher. Okay. So this is something that has been done for literally thousands of years. Um, so like what would be the general process of encrypting this? Um, so to encrypt uh, using this method, say that you have plain text like, like this. This is the plain text that we are encrypting. Okay, so you take this plain text. It has spaces in it and stuff. Of course, we're going to ignore that. We're just going to smush all these characters together. So this has 37 characters. We ignore the spaces. Um, and so you can choose. You can basically choose um, the number of columns that you want to, uh, that you want to uh, split this into. So the idea here is that the number of columns is, is the key. Okay, um, the number of columns, and we could say like knowing this method, but really all you need once you know this method is is the number of columns that you're splitting it up into uh, in order to decrypt. 
So then how does this work? Let's say that you decide to use five columns. So it has 37 characters. So you're not going to be able to write it evenly in five columns. But let's say that you write it uh, in five columns in this way. There it is. You can, already, you can still read it, right? This is the plain text that we are encrypting. All right, so you can still read it in this zigzag fashion. There it is, broken into five columns. And we've stacked this last, we've, we've done it in such a way that there was a choice here. But uh, we could say that, you know, according to us, we always want the, the, you know, if there's any bits left over, we want them pushed to the left. Now, that's a choice, of course. Depending on how your zigzag is working, you could decide to do something else there but we're gonna we're gonna say that we're doing it this way okay so um, then to get the cipher text instead of reading zigzagged which actually gives you the plain text you read column by column so reading column by column this is T S L E A R R N H T A X T E Y G and so on okay so there is our cipher text again we smushed everything together we've ignored any spaces Okay, so here's our ciphertext. All right, so then um, how do I go backwards? All right, so my recipient gets this ciphertext and has been told that the number of columns being used is five. Okay, so the recipient can just count and see there's 37 characters, going to be broken into five columns. Uh, 37 divided by five is 7.4, so you, you want to group the letters into groups of eight and seven. So you're going to have two groups of eight and three groups of seven. So you write it like this, right? And that's exactly the, the column writing that we got here. And then to decrypt, of course, you read row wise, right? This is zigzag fashion. Okay. All right. So then how would one go about breaking this sort of encryption? Um, well, uh, suppose that you're uh, ciphertext gets uh, intercepted, right? So if your ciphertext gets intercepted by um, someone, um, they don't know the key. So then they don't know how many columns to break this into, right? So if you don't know, you just know that it's in some array having some dimensions. So say we call the dimensions R by C here with R rows and C columns, okay? So we know that it's some r by c array um the question though is like which r by c's are allowed well um i know that there's 37 characters right so that puts a restriction on what my r and c can be so the possibilities here are 3 by 13 4 by 10 8 by 5 7 by 6. the reason for this being of course that it has to fit in all these characters if the array is smaller than this it wouldn't fit all the characters in so that's all that this restriction is saying, okay? And so you get you get some possibilities, okay? And you have to try them out. So uh, first possibility is three by 13. If you use that, right, then you have 13 columns, three rows. This is what it looks like. So you f put the ciphertext into this form and then you just try to read it, right, in zigzag, but that doesn't make any sense. Right, so this one's nonsensical. So then you would try something else. You would try 4 by 10, you try 8 by 5, maybe 7 by 6 if you did it in that order. But when you get to five columns, you're going to get the right answer. Okay, so when you, if you're going through here trying to exhaust this, when you get to five columns, you're going to get the right answer. Okay, so um, it, there's a suggested method here. I'll, I'll just go over this and then I'll mention the double encryption on the next uh, page. So um, you could, of course, uh, do something slightly different to make uh, this harder to decrypt. Um, so something that you could do here is, uh, is suggested is you could permute the, per, permute, permute the columns according to some prearranged keyword. Okay, so um, you could have a key word, say in this case, water. Okay. Um, and W is the first letter of water, A is the second letter, T is the third, and so on. Okay. Then you put the letters of water in alphabetical order. So A, E, R, T, W. Okay. Then what you do here is put the columns in the order 2, 4, 5, 3, 1, corresponding to the alphabetization of, of water. So once you put water into alphabetic 
um, of vertical order, then uh, assign numbers to your columns in the same way and and put the columns in that order, two, four, five, three, one. So first column goes last, second column goes furthest to the left, and, and so on like this. Okay. Um, so um, uh, this gives you the following array. It looks like that, um, which gives you ciphertext that looks different. And it turns out that this is a lot harder for Eve to deal with. So Eve is our person breaking the, uh, trying to break the, the ciphertext. So um, this is a lot harder uh, to deal with. So someone trying to, someone intercepting this message and trying to, um, to break this encryption, it's, it's, it's tougher because uh, they basically have to guess this uh, key order, right? Two, four, five, three, one correctly. If they don't, then they have, they, they can't undo what has been done here. So while that is something that could be, that could be done, um, that could, that could still be uh, a trial and error brute force uh, it, this could be brute force. It's, it's harder. And of course you could repeat this procedure again to double encrypt it, which would make it even, even harder, um, um, to do. So anyway, um, and this is actually used even up through world war two. Uh, this was used in some, uh, some variant of this, uh, was used. Okay. So, um, Moving on then to another example, uh, stream ciphers. Um, so uh, this is an example of a cipher. That if, you've, if you've taken Math 401, uh, this is one of the applications that's done somewhere near the end of the course, or maybe toward like the last third of the course. Uh, they talk about uh, uh, stream ciphers in this way. I can't remember if the, this name is actually used. Um, so anyway, the, the idea is that um, you are actually going to uh, encode your plain text message one bit at a time, okay, or, or one letter, one character at a time. But uh, So you're going to encode this plain text message one bit at a time, and we'll see that there are ways to do this in a manner that's, uh, that's pretty slick that... Uh, that is recursive um, and for various reasons is, is kind of a nice way of, of, of dealing with this because um, in terms of what is needed to, to crank out the entire thing in terms of uh, the key, only a little bit is needed to, to generate uh, the key. So anyway, um, so for instance, say that you have, um, say that you have characters represented by binary, okay? So if you're talking ASCII, you have letter A, which is 10000001. Uh, B is 10000010. Okay. Um, and so um, what is the key? The key is just a string of zeros and ones that has the same length as the plain text. And so in order to encrypt, you just add this in binary to the plain text since it's the same length you can do this um, and since we're adding this in binary uh, and doing this addition mod 2 um, this is equivalent to a process called XORing right or uh, the exclusive or if you're familiar with that logical symbol or the logical process of, of talking about the exclusive or that's what you're doing here um, so thinking about what's happening right so 0 plus 0 is 0 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 0. So you can think about that for a second, um, why that is the same thing as the XOR uh, or, uh, symbol. So um, so then how this goes is that I, I just add my key. So let's say that this is my, uh, uh, this is my key. So my plain text is 10110011, and my key is the second string of characters. I just add it to, to the first thing and, and reduce these mod two. So that's what I get. Um, and so how do I unencrypt that bit? Uh, how do I decrypt that bit? Well, decrypting the bit is easy because it's mod two. So I can just add the key again, right? Because mod two, if I add a thing and then add it again, well, then it's, a, it's you know, so imagine I have X. Right, X plus A is something mod two. Uh, 
but x plus a plus a, right, adding a again, is x plus 2a, which is just x mod 2, right? So adding a thing, adding the same thing twice in a row, mod 2, is the same as adding 0, okay? Um, so um, then what what is going on here? If you're encrypting then uh, uh, bits uh, one at a time, then uh, if plain text bit at the nth step is p sub n and x sub n is the key and c sub n is my encrypted my ciphertext bit at the nth step then i am xoring these by adding the key to the plain text bit and getting my ciphertext bit okay so as it says here what this is saying is that i have stream cipher encryption is plain text bit key bit XOR those things by adding them mod 2. That's the ciphertext bit. Okay, and this is called a stream cipher because you're thinking about it as this, like, as this process that is happening bit by bit. Okay, so you are, you are cranking it through here. Okay, so there are many ways that you can talk about stream ciphers, and some are actually really, um, really sophisticated, which is mentioned um, here. So um, uh, a couple of examples. One's called the one-time pad, which is uh, you use a random process to generate a random sequence of zeros and ones as key, and then use that uh, to encrypt by XORing it with the plain text like, like we just did. Um, okay, so, um, so that's one way that you can go about it. But the more interesting thing uh, to us uh, is going to be this linear feedback shift register. So um, the idea here is that... Um, for instance, uh, think about having uh, a stream cipher defined in a way analogous to, say, the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, except we're going to be considering the Fibonacci sequence mod two here, right? So Fibonacci sequence is take two, uh, take two integers, um, and here we're just going to start out with one and one. So x of one and x of two are both one. Um, so these are called the seed because you're going to generate uh, all the bits. Um, from the in the key from those seed values uh, and you're going to do that by defining a recurrence okay using those things so from x of one and x of two we get the third key bit from adding those two mod two all right so x of three is x of one plus x of two which is one plus one which is congruent to zero mod two okay um, and so then again to get the fourth key bit i add the second and third key bits together so 1 plus 0, which is 1 mod 2. And to get the fifth key bit, I would add the, four, the third and fourth key bits together, mod 2. Okay, so in general, you have this relationship. Uh, X sub n plus 2 is congruent to X sub n plus X sub n plus 1 mod 2. This is a Fibonacci sequence mod 2. So it's sequence uh, defined recursively as the n plus second term in the sequence is the sum of the two terms before it, right? So rephrase it another way. Any term in that... Um, any term in that sequence is the sum of the terms, the two terms immediately before it. Okay, and so you can use those two key bits to generate an infinitely long sequence right there. There it is, Fibonacci sequence mod two. Okay, um, and so this is an example of recurrence relation. So um, in general, of course, you can so you can generalize this process so that um, you get a general recurrence relation of some length so you can start out with a key bit of or key bits of whatever length so however many you want and you can define a recurrence relation in this way um where again all these coefficients are are in zero one so all this this addition everything here is done mod two so there's there's multiple um you know examples of these recurrence relations that you could come up with so this is called a linear feedback shift register sequence or lfsr sequence um and so the the way that this goes, the best way to see uh, what is nice about this is the following picture. So the idea here is that here's my string of bits in the sequence. The idea here is whatever gets outputted by this machine, uh, basically it this, so x sub n and x sub n plus 2, for instance, if we're, uh, if we're looking at... Uh, Oh, so um, the, the example they're using is for n equals 7. 
but um, it, it, it doesn't matter um, the, the specifics of this. The idea here is that um, I can XOR, say, X of N and X of N plus 2. XORing these gives me the X of N plus 3 bit, which essentially is cranking this sequence out one bit at a, at a time. This gets fed back into this stream. Okay, that's the that's the idea. So this is what the picture looks like for this specific recurrence relation. Of course, it would look slightly different uh, if you had a, a different recurrence relation here. And so here's listed, if you want to have a look at that, this is all on uh, page 174, 175. Um, this is... Uh, how stream ciphers go essentially you can think about these as cranking out uh the key bits one at a time from this recurrence um uh relation so um the thing is that uh the issue with this as you might have thought is that in decrypting uh, a stream cipher um what is needed eventually is uh so some some correct guesses have to be made, but once enough of the key bits are computed, well, then the person decrypting this can generate the entire key from the same recurrence relation. So what is important then in decrypting this is figuring out this recurrence relation in the in the first place. Okay, so once that is done, then the entire key can be uh generated uh, in the same way that the person that wanted to encrypt and generate the key in the first place generated it okay so um so anyway that's uh that's that's how that works i know we're going through this uh, a little bit fast but it really this is more just to give you kind of an overview of uh of what's going on with these okay so then uh Block ciphers are going to be the last uh, cipher I talk about other than I'm, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, uh, secret sharing, uh, which is kind of a neat application of some of the same sorts of principles. Um, so what are what are block ciphers then? Um, so the contrast between block ciphers and say stream ciphers is that rather than encrypting bit by bit, block ciphers are going to encrypt like a block of bits at once. Okay, and so... Um, here we can actually use writing to sensibly do this. Okay. So what's the idea with block ciphers? So uh, the idea is say that we have plain text uh, that says uh, attack at dawn. Okay, then uh, let's say for our example, um, our block length is two. Okay, so what we would do is we take this plain text and break it into blocks of two. So A T T A uh, C K A T D A W N. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. What if you chose, uh, say, block length 5? What would that look like? Well, you'd put A, T, T, A, C, uh, K, A, T, D, A, and then you've run out of letters here, but you need another block of 5. So W, N, and then some dummy letter to fill it out. So the textbook uses X here. X is definitely a good choice there. Okay. So um, what is the idea? So a simple example of a block cipher. Of course, there's, there's multiple sorts of block ciphers. But a simple example of a block cipher is what's called the Hill cipher. Um, so what is the Hill cipher? So uh, the key, so this is from 1929, I think. So the key is an n by n integer matrix m 
that has an inverse mod 26. Okay. Hmm. Has an inverse mod 26. So I have to think in a second exactly what that means. Right. So uh, an example is uh, let's uh, look at n equals 2. Uh, so let's say that our m is 2 by 2 matrix uh, 5, 7, 2, 11. Uh, if n is uh, minus 1, 3, 12, 9, uh, then mn is equal to, if I multiply those out, I'm not going to recopy those, so if I multiply those out, I will get uh, 79 reading row wise, 79, 78, 130, 105. And if I reduce that mod 26, this is actually 1001 mod 26. So we haven't talked about matrices mod 26, but it's uh, it, it works exactly like you think it does. Okay. And so N is the inverse of M mod 26. And so M would be a valid key for this. Okay, now this is actually isn't the first time we've, of course, needed to talk about inverses mod 26. Um, in fact, uh, in order to uh, decrypt some of this stuff, especially the uh, um, uh, the previous ciphers that we talked about, um, uh, this knowing how to do this was needed, but we're going to talk about it more uh, specifically um now, so the big question is, how would you find n if it wasn't given to you? So the question, how to find n? Well, as you might have guessed, not every integer matrix m is going to have an inverse mod 26 because you know that not every not every matrix period has an inverse, right? Regardless of talking about mod 26 or not. So the question is, how do you find n? Well, uh, I note that uh, the inverse of a 2x2 two two matrix, you know how to do that, right? This is one of the nicer ways. This is basically... The existence of this formula is the reason why, when you're dealing with matrices, almost always the example that you're given when you're computing an inverse is a 2 by 2 to illustrate what's going on, because this, this is so nice. Thus, M inverse, if I just try to use the inverse formula for a 2 by 2, what happens? So this is uh, 5, 7, 2, 11 inverse. So what is this if I just straight up plug these things in? This is 1 over 41 times 11, then minus 5 is here, minus 2, and 5. Okay, so then what is the problem with this expression, mod 26? Well, in the mod 26 world, I have no idea what 1 over 41 is, right? So note... mod 26 1 over 41 is really the multiplicative inverse of 41 mod 26 that's that's what 1 over 41 is okay but how do you find the multiplicative inverse of 41 mod 26? What do you have to solve? You have to solve 
this. Okay. You have to solve this. Of course, we discussed how to do this in chapter six, right? This is solving linear congruences. And so without too much more, uh, it turns out that if you solve that, x is seven. Thus, one over 41 is actually seven mod 26. All right, so this object, one over 41, is really 7 in the mod 26 world. And so multiplying this matrix by 1 over 41, mod 26 is actually just multiplying by 7. Okay. Thus, using that, you know, I'll just draw an arrow up here. This is really 7 times 11 minus 5 minus 2, 5. So if I multiply this out and then reduce mod 26, what do I get? Oh, I get minus 1, 3, or sorry, mi <laughs> minus 1, 3, 12, 9. Okay, mod 26. But this is, this is n that I was given before, right? Okay, so that's how you'd find this. Okay. All right. So um, let's do an example. So example, uh, my plain text is hide this. Okay. My key is M, which is my matrix uh, 5, 7, 2, 11. Okay. All right. So then how does how does this work? Okay. So I break plain text into blocks of n, which in my case, since m is a 2 by 2, this little n is 2. All right, so I break plain text into blocks of two. Okay, convert each letter to a number. So in the usual way, A is zero, B is one, C is two, and so on. Okay. And then what I do is I regard each block as an n-dimensional vector. So then regard each block as a 2 by 1, n by 1 in the general case, of course, vector. So I consider it just a column vector with two entries and so for hide this what does this become using this process See? so I take this and I have HI here so this becomes HI I haven't converted yet I'll do that in a second uh, DE uh, TH and then uh, I S. So then converting these to numbers, this becomes H I that's seven, eight. Uh, D E is three, four. T H is 19, seven. And I S is eight, 18. Okay. Now, how do I encrypt this? I multiply by m. I multiply each of these vectors by m on the left. Okay. And so I'm not going to actually write that out. I'm just going to show it to you in the textbook. So in the textbook, I multiply each of these vectors on the left by m. 
And when I do that, I get vectors 13, 24, 17, 24, 17, 24, 10, 6. Of course, I've reduced this mod 26. Um, and reducing it mod 26, now I can make sense of it in terms of my, my alphabet. Right, so all these values will be between 0 and 25. And so then I get blocks of text here. So n is 13, y is 24, and so on. And so the ciphertext I get is the following, n, y, r, y, o, l, k, g. That's the ciphertext, just translating these vectors resulting from multiplying each of the vectors I got uh, from blockifying that thing. Um, into the ciphertext, right? Multiplying those by n. Okay, and so how do I decrypt? Well, the recipient gets the ciphertext. To decrypt, you know the size of the blocks. That's that's included in the key, right? Because the so the key is that matrix M. The size of that matrix tells you the size of the block. So it's a two by two. So I break this up into two, into blocks of two, and I do the same process. I turn those blocks into numerical things. So there they are. And then I would multiply each of those by M inverse, right? And so the result, of course, is exactly what it has to be by virtue of the fact that it's an inverse. And so you recover the plain text, hide this. Okay. And so um, block ciphers are, are nice. And in fact, um, uh, the, so the, the thing about, um, the thing about the hill cipher is that it's, it's good. Um, it, it's, it's pretty good, but, uh, it's not that secure. Um, although as this notes, the reason why it wasn't widely adopted ha didn't have to do with its security. It's because it took too long to do. So even if you're dealing with six by six matrices, which aren't that, uh, you know, aren't that big, relatively speaking. It, it, this is really slow. Um, and so the block ciphers that are used more widely are these standards that I um, mentioned at the very beginning of this stuff, which is DES and AES. If you're interested in those, you can look those up. So that's Data Encryption Standard and uh, Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, unfortunately, so uh, DES uh, uses plain text blocks of 64 bits. Uh, AES uses 128 bit. So when you hear... If you've ever, you know, been hearing something stupid from a movie like, oh, it's encryption 64-bit, 128-bit, that's one of the things that is being referenced there by really bad movie writers. Um, so anyway, um, uh, if you're interested in those, you can look those up. They don't really have anything to do with number theory, so I'm not going to mention anything else uh, about them. We'll talk about other sorts of uh, encryption later um, after Chapter 8. Um, so the very last thing I wanted to do from chapter seven uh, and then be done with it um, is uh, the following. So um, this is the concept of secret sharing. Now this is, uh, it's, it's a neat trick. Um, it, it, it's not quite like the last sections that we talk about. It's slightly different. Um, so what's the idea here? Um, so the situation that's presented to you is the following. You're the manager of a bank and you want to skip work tomorrow. Um, but unfortunately, just because you're not there doesn't mean that the bank safe is not also going to be there. So bank safe has to be there. It's got to be guarded. Like it's, it's, it has got to be opened at some point by, by the employees. Right. But you're not going to be there to do it. Okay. So, um, what do you do? You don't want to give all of the info required to open the safe to a single employee. Maybe you don't trust them a hundred percent to be the, the sole person that knows that. And so your, your conundrum is that you want to distribute info to some group of your employees in such a way that no single one of them knows enough to open the safe on their own. Um, but two of them with the correct m amount of info, uh, could do it. Right. So the, 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 the scheme is that, um, basically a single employee is not going to have enough info to, to the locks combination, but any two employees together can come up with the combination. Okay. 
So then um, the problem is if you just try to do the, maybe the first thing that pops into your head um, that's su suggested here, which is first idea is to give the first number of the combination to half the employees and give the last two numbers to the other half. So we'll say that the, the, your, your safe has three, three numbers in its, com in its uh, combination. Okay. The problem with that is that, well, it works fine if the two employees that get together, you know, one of them has the first number and the other one has the last two numbers, that's fine. But what happens if two of them get together and those two were both only given the first number? Or two get together and those two were only given the last two numbers? So then they, they wouldn't be able to deduce uh, the last bit of the combo. So um, so that that is not going to work uh, on its own. Right. And so then the um, the example that is thought of here, uh, the idea is that what you want to be true is that two people determine a secret. OK, so you want any two people to determine uh, the secret, in this case, the combo to the to the bank vault. OK, um, and then you're you are inspired because you think back to high school geometry and you remember, you know, one of these postulates of Euclid that two points determine a line. Okay, so, you know, thought of another way. If you know one point, that is not enough to tell you anything about a line, right? Infinitely many lines pass through a given point. But if you have two points, well, then there's a unique line that passes through those two points, right? So, um, so then what is the idea here? To represent the combination as the slope of a line, give each employee a point on the line, then one employee by themselves can't figure out the slope, right? So one, one by themselves can't figure out the slope, but any two of them, right, if they represent distinct points on the line, will be able to figure out the slope, right? So that's the, that's the idea, okay? And so the example given is, uh, say the locks combination is 1734, 2, right? So 1734, 0, 2. Okay, which you just write as one block, uh, 173402, right? So you can work with real numbers, but there's issues there with round off errors. So let's just say you're working with integers here. Um, so we are going to, uh, we're going to do all of this mod some prime. Okay, so this will prevent us from having to deal with any kind of round off stuff. So then uh, let's assume the largest possibility for each number of the combination is 40. Right, so there's only 40 possibilities for each number here, um, or 41 if 0, 0 is allowed. So uh, we need a prime larger than 40, 40, 40, right? Why 40, 40, 40? Again, you know, in each slot here, 40 is the largest number that can show up. So you need a prime larger than 40, 40, 40. Um, here's a prime that's larger than that, 40, 40, 51. That apparently is a prime. Now pick a line. You want the slope of that line to be your combination, 173402. Okay, so choose a random intercept, say 141421, and form this line, mod that big prime that you've picked. Okay, so there's your, there's your line. Whoop, I'm off camera. So there's your line here, okay. So then say that you have five employees, A, B, C, D, and E. You want to give them five distinct points on that line. So, you, of course, you're given the equation for a line generating points on the lines, no big deal. There you go, just one, two, three, four, five, and then you see what their what their y coordinate is. Okay, so there's the points you give them. Okay. All right. Um, and so, uh, finding the slope is, you know exactly how to find slope uh, between two points on the line, and look what happens when you compute, say, uh, C and D. You take these two points, you try to compute the slope, you get this number, but mod 40, 40, 51, that is exactly the combination, right? So so that does it. So this is kind of a clever way of of solving that issue um, that, uh, that you had um, in wanting to disseminate this info in such a way that it's, it is... Uh, you know, it is still secret. No one of them can figure it out on their own. They have to they have to collaborate with someone else. But any two of them pairwise could do it. And of course, this process, uh, as it's mentioned, can be generalized here. Um, 
uh, in the following way. You could actually generalize it to curves other than, than lines. You could use parabola or you could use higher degree uh, things here to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to do this in some other way. You don't have to use uh, a line, but this is uh, using a line is one way of doing it. There's one little caveat here, I'll say, um, that if you chose the pair B and E, right, um, then when you want to open the save, you try to compute the slope. But because for B and E here, the X coordinates are five and two, whoops, sorry, I'm off the camera. So the X coordinates are five and two for E and B respectively. So that when you compute the slope, um, your denominator is 5 minus 2. Now it is no longer up here. In this example, it's 1, so it was easy to deal with. Here I get a denominator of 3 here, right? So you look at this thing, and of course the numerator is not divisible by 3, so I can't simplify this. I have 116155 divided by 3 mod that huge prime. So then what do you, what do, you do with, a, with an expression like this? So... Just like we did for 1 over 41 mod 26, this expression is nonsensical mod 26 left as it is, right? This doesn't make any sense. You can't just leave some fraction like this. You can't reduce 41 mod 26 and say, yep, the, you know, that fraction's fine. Um, that's, that's not how it works. So um, 1 over 41, of course, means the multiplicative inverse of 41. So you have to find out what that is, mod 26. So similarly, here you should view this as 116155 times the multiplicative inverse of 3, mod 40, 40, 40, 51. Okay. And so, of course, this is found using the extended Euclidean algorithm. You can, you can find what the multiplicative inverse of this thing is. So there it is. It's, it is 134684 mod 40, 40, 51. So the multiplicative inverse of this thing is this number. And so uh, what this slope is, is actually this product, okay, which is exactly still the same combination. So when you're doing this, these sorts of modular arithmetic computations, um, basically just ask yourself, right, when you, when you get to some kind of like fraction that's not going to reduce immediately, this, this sort of thing is what you're going to have to do, which is slightly annoying, of course, compared to, just being able to deal with it like a fraction is normal if you're dealing with rational numbers or real numbers. But um, in the modular world, right, one third doesn't necessarily make any sense on its on its face. Okay. So, no, the exposition of this is a little bit awkward because it, there's just so much text. Um, so it would take me absolutely forever to um, do that without having the... The, the aid of, of the book, as I said, in, in person, I would actually um, hand out uh, you know, print offs of, of these things, but of course we can't do that. So anyway, um, moving on to chapter eight. So we're leaving behind the cryptography stuff. We'll return to it um, in a little bit, but um, first we have to get some more, uh, uh, some more fundamentals going. So um, chapter eight is called Fermat, Euler, and Wilson, um, and you'll see why. So the first thing I want to talk about is Fermat's Little Theorem. Now the textbook calls this Fermat's Theorem. Uh, it's usually called Fermat's Little Theorem. I think the reason is to try to um, try to contrast it with uh, Fermat's last theorem, um, you know, which is this famous, uh, it was an open problem until the mid nineties and one of the most, most famous problems in number theory. Um, but so the textbook just calls this Fermat's theorem. Uh, you won't be confused by this once you see the form that it takes. Uh, what's the idea behind Fermat's little theorem? Uh, the idea is uh, look at the pattern, right? So look at the following pattern. So looking at the following pattern, you might say, okay, what is 2 squared minus 2 congruent to mod 2? Mm, I'm not going to write it in yet. And then I look at 2 cubed minus 2. What is that congruent to mod 3? 
And what's this pattern I'm looking at? It's 2 to some power minus 2. And that's congruent to something mod whatever that power was. So I'm going to keep going here. So this 2 to the 4 minus 2 is congruent to something mod 4. And then 2 to the 5th minus 2 is congruent to something mod 5. And 2 to the 6th minus 2 is congruent to something mod 6. And 2 to the 7th minus 2 is congruent to something mod 7. And 2 to the 8th minus 2 is congruent to something mod 8. And 2 to the 9th minus 2 is congruent to something mod 9. Let's just keep at it. We'll go all the way up to 11. So here's what I'm looking at. All right, there we go. So, well, what do we notice? We can actually quickly compute some of these things. So this is 4 minus 2. That's 2, which is 0 mod 2. This is 8 minus 2, so that's 6 mod 3. Since it's divisible by 3, that's 0. 2 to the 4 minus 2 is 16 minus 2, so that's 14. Mod 4, that's not congruent to 0. So I could say what it's congruent to. I'm just going to say it's not congruent to 0. 2 to the 5th minus 2, this is 32 minus 2, so that's... 30, that's congruent to 0 mod 5. 2 to the 6 minus 2, this is um, 64 minus 2, so 62. Mod 6, it's definitely not congruent to 0. 2 to the 7th minus 2, that's 128 minus 2, so it's 126. Mod 7, is that divisible by 7? Yeah, it is. That's, that's divisible by 7, so this is congruent to 0 Ugh, mod 7. Um, and going through the rest of these, um, these are not congruent to 0. Uh, there's this one, but this one is. Okay. So, it is tempting. To say that 2 to the n minus 2 is congruent to 0 mod n if and only if n is prime okay but two to the 341 minus two is actually congruent to zero mod 341 where 341, that looks prime, but it's not. It's 11 times 31. Okay. Hmm. So this is not true. Okay. But what part is not true? Well, actually, only this forward direction. So, so the only part that's, that's not true in this if and only if statement is the forward part. So the backwards part that if n is prime, then this is congruent to zero mod n, that's, that's actually true. So this is not true, but half of the statement is true. Okay. In fact, it's better than that. We just did this for two. So there's a more general statement we can make. Okay, so this is Fermat's little theorem. Okay. So let P be prime. So first part for every integer b, b to the p minus b is congruent to zero mod p. Okay. 
of course, equivalently, you could write this as b to the p is congruent to b mod p. That's that's fine. Okay, and sometimes you might see it in this form, but that's not too confusing. Um, secondly, if b is not congruent to 0 mod p, then b to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. Okay. So, um, how can we, uh, let me see some examples of this. So, uh, here's a couple. Um, note, 2 to the 6th is uh, 64, which is congruent to 1 mod 7. So that satisfies the second part of this um, and 2 to the 7 is congruent to 2 mod 7. Hmm. Okay. Of course you could say that you could have once you have this you, you can just multiply by 2 here. So you get 2 to the 7 is congruent to 2 mod 7. This is another way of seeing it. Um, here's another example. So, um, what about uh, exponents that are multiples of p minus 1? So, what do I mean by that? So, the idea is, uh, what is 3 to the 28 mod 5? Well, 3 to the 28 is congruent to 3 to the 4 to the 7, which is congruent to 1 to the seventh, which is congruent to one mod five. Now why could I do that? Because 28 was a multiple of P minus one, in this case, five minus one, All right? So 28 is a multiple of five minus one, which is four. Another example of how you can use this is say that you're asked uh, to divide 23 into 7 to the 200. What is the remainder? Well, this is asking what is 7 to the 200 mod 23. Okay. Well, by Fermat's little theorem, seven to the twenty-second is congruent to one mod twenty-three. Right. Thus, uh, seven to the two hundred which is congruent to 7 to the 22nd to the 9 times 7 squared. How did I get this? This is just the division algorithm applied to 222, right? Okay, so I'm dividing 200 by 22 here. So this is congruent to 1 to the 9th times 7 squared, which is 49, which is congruent, of course, to... Uh, that's 26, 46. I can subtract from 49, so that's 3 mod 23. And so you quickly were able to answer the question. If you take 7 to the 200, divide it by 23, what's the remainder? 3. All right. And this is done quickly with Fermat's little theorem. So actually, this last example I did is pretty neat. Note, um, 200 
is 22 times 9 plus 2 from the division algorithm. Okay, i.e. 200 is congruent to 2 mod 22. Okay. And so there is a fact, of course, that follows directly from Fermat's little theorem that we can always apply for exponents like this. So here's a corollary. So the following corollary is let P be prime and let B be not congruent to zero mod P. So if X is congruent to Y mod P minus 1, then B to the X is congruent to B to the Y mod P. Okay. This is a nice fact. In fact, I'm going to restate it at the top of the next page because I'm going to prove it. So, so I had this corollary. So B uh, is not congruent to 0 mod P. P prime. And X is congruent to Y mod P minus 1. Then, this means that b to the x is congruent to b to the y mod p. Now, let me give a warning. So, caveat. I should say here before I prove this really quickly, assuming Fermat's little theorem. So, um, note x is congruent to y mod p minus 1. Okay. I.e., not mod p. Okay. So this uh, they're trying to use congruences mod p in the exponent will lead to wrong statements. Okay, there's a simple example of this, I think. So, uh, example. Uh, so, 6 is congruent to 1 mod 5. Uh, but 2 to the 6, which is 64, is not congruent to 2 to the 1, which is 2 mod 5. In fact, it's congruent to 4 mod 5. Okay. Right. Um, but it's not always wrong. 5 is congruent to 1 uh, mod 4. Oh, actually, this is an example showing what, what, is, what actually works, not... Uh, but it, it's it's true that it's not always wrong. It's 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 wrong for some things. But um, but in general, this is a this is a bad thing uh, to do. And it might seem a little confusing at first that that uh, these don't work out, right? But this is exactly why these tricks uh, exist in the first place because you can't just replace exponents. It doesn't work like that, right? You can't just replace the exponents with that are that are congruent 
um, it, it has to it has to work out just right. So in this case, um, five is congruent to one mod four, um, and uh, two to the fifth is congruent to two to the one mod five. Right, so that works out fine. Okay. So quickly, let's do proof of the corollary before um, I actually uh, get to a proof of Fermat's uh, little theorem. So proof of corollary. Uh, so first of all, um, since x <clears throat> is congruent to y mod p minus 1, then by the definition of congruence mod p minus 1, uh, I can write x as y plus p minus 1 k for some integer k. All right. Thus, b to the x is uh, equal to uh, b to the, just using this statement here, this is b to the y times b to the p minus 1 to the k. Right? But b to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 by Fermat's little theorem. Right? So Fermat's little theorem says that if b is not congruent to 0 mod p, then b to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. So this is congruent to 1 to the k, right? So this is b to the y times 1 to the k is congruent to b to the y mod p. And that's exactly the statement. So you see exactly where this comes in, right? So this is by Fermat's little theorem. Okay. The unfortunate thing about calling it Fermat's little theorem instead of just Fermat's theorem is when you abbreviated FLT, well, that's the same abbreviation as Fermat's last theorem. So that is uh, slightly unfortunate. Okay. So then the last thing I wanted to, to say, I'm not going to have time to start on the proofs of Fermat's Little Theorem. Uh, I'm actually going to prove uh, Fermat's Little Theorem in two ways, so I'll start uh, with that tomorrow. But um, uh, what I want to say uh, is that uh, there is an application of Fermat's Little Theorem. So. So an application of Fermat's little theorem is uh, showing a number is composite without factoring. Obviously, if you factored a number, well, that's great, but um, you can actually uh, use Fermat's little theorem to show that something is composite without factoring. So how do you do that? Um, well, if the contrapositive of FLT uh, for odd primes, it's annoying otherwise. What is the contrapositive for odd primes? It's if n is odd and 2 to the n minus 1 is not congruent to 1 mod n, then n is not prime. Why is that the contrapositive of the second part of Fermat's little theorem? So, here, right? Okay, so we're assuming that P is prime. So then, if we have an integer satisfying this, such that this is not the case, then we know that P can't be prime, right? Because if P is prime, this has to follow. 
So contrapositive tells me this. Okay. So you can actually use this to show some pretty large numbers are, are uh, not prime. So uh, example 77 is not prime. Now, before I know what you're going to say, 77 is tiny, right? Of course, uh, of course, I don't need any help showing that 77 is not prime, but how would you do this? You'd say, okay, 2 squared is congruent to 4 mod 77. Okay. And then continuing on, 2 to the 4th is congruent to 16 mod 77. 2 to the 8th is congruent to... Uh, 16 squared turns out to be 25 mod 77 and 2 to the 16 is congruent to uh, 625 which is congruent to 9 mod 77 2 to the 32nd is congruent to uh, 9 squared which is 4 mod 77 uh, 2 to the 64 is congruent to 4 squared which is 16 mod 77 and then lastly the last one I need 2 to the 76 I can get from 2 to the 64 times 2 to the 8th times 2 to the 4th so this is a 16 times 25 times 16 which it turns out is congruent to 9 mod uh, 77 thus 2 to the 76 is not congruent to 1 mod 77, so 77 is not prime. Okay. Okay. Now, what is the what is the benefit of doing this again? You know, this, this seems like a lot of work just to say that 77 is not prime. The benefit is that you can do it without factoring. So the example that is where, not necessarily by Fermat's Little Theorem, I'm actually not sure what method uh, was used to show this, but in, so the seventh Fermat number, uh, so two to the two to the seven plus one is composite. This was shown in 1905. I'm not actually sure what the method is. I'd have to look it up. Um, so it was, sh it was shown in 1905 that this was composite, but no factors were known until 1970. So this is to give you an idea of how hard it can be to factor some really, really gigantic uh, primes. And so if you uh, have some fact or some process that you can apply that can show you that a number is composite without actually having to factor it, that is really, really good. Uh, I'm not saying that it's always a really uh, strong thing necessarily or or practical but it is uh, like inherently that is a very good uh, uh, thing to have going on uh, being able to show something that's composite without factoring it because factoring these gigantic numbers can be a real a real mess okay as we'll see all right so I think that's it for today I'll clean up last week's lectures I haven't added to the playlist or put up on the main syllabus like lecture uh, schedule page I'll, I'll do that later today um, so every everything should be maximally cleaned up by the time of tomorrow's lecture so anyway i will see you all tomorrow morning um i will post your uh your fourth homework um later today as well so like i said every everything will be nice and uh and organized by uh by tomorrow morning so anyway i will see you all later